Good evening everybody and welcome to the Mental Health Professionals Network live webinar this evening. This one is about working together to overcome the challenges of rural practice in mental health. Now I'd like to welcome the 200 plus um, participants tonight um, from all over Australia and in fact there's a couple of people from overseas too. I think we have someone from India. Um, and I, I've been watching the chat box and I can see there's people from literally all over Australia. So um, a very big welcome to everybody. I'm Mary Amalias. I'm a GP um, in Cairns in North Queensland. I work currently in rural in um, youth mental health at a Headspace site, but I was a rural GP for about five years on the Atherton Tablelands. Um, and I've facilitated quite a few of these webinars and I think you'll find it's a really um, interesting platform and a good way of having a discussion together. And the people that we've got um, on the panel tonight are um, I'm sure going to provide you with a really interesting discussion and lots of useful tips and uh, <coughs> food for thought. So um, you will have received the um, bios about our uh, panellists before tonight's session and had a look at those. So I'm just going to welcome them one by one. So first of all I'd like to welcome Graham. So Graham's a GP and he joins us from South Australia. Graham plays a lead role in a project which has successfully re reduced suicide rates in his rural area and Graham I actually am fairly sure that you initiated that project and it was a very big project to take on and it's lasted a number of years. So what, um, what do you think have been the keys to the, the success of that Graham? Uh, there's four platforms um, that we use. One was community education, which is vitally important. The second one was increasing community capacity. That means training people to do different things, uh, like training counsellors to be around locally, training the nurses to be more upfront with dealing with mental health problems, um, uh, GPs more aware of uh, screening for mental health uh, symptoms. Uh, the third thing we did was uh, run a schools program where we actually looked for emotionally or behaviourally challenged children in the school. And the fourth thing we, we did was uh, promoted early intervention at the very earliest stage, thinking that if we could get things early, we could actually manage them locally rather than be sent off to Adelaide. So that was that was the, the four platforms, but the most important one was just uh, education of community widespread. Any organisation I could get into I spoke to. It's, it's fantastic and it's such a great example of collaboration, not, not just between um, mental health clinicians but the whole community. So it's fantastic to have you on the panel. And I'd like to welcome Captain David West. David's a mental health nurse and a Navy captain and it's great to have you with us. I understand that um, some of your, your role in the Navy does include mental health work and um, I wonder if you'd like to share with us some of the, the most challenging or maybe one challenging experience you've had in that role if you're allowed to. Oh, certainly. I um, uh, provide mental health support at sea for, for warships deployed um, out at sea, often several days uh, sailing from, uh, from any port and uh, of course we've just wound up in um, part of the Middle East but Naval will have a very strong presence, continue to have a strong presence in the Middle East. So in terms of uh, a rural or remote uh, and although that's my civilian practice, there's not much more remote than being three days sail from anywhere in the middle of the Red Sea and uh, your helo's broken, we can't get spares um, and uh, and we only have batches of, uh, of, of broadband uh, internet because uh, as strange as it may seem, the, uh, the, the skipper has higher priorities than um, providing for the, the needs of the deployed mental health service. <laughs> it does sound remote, David. <laughs> um, welcome to the panel. And um, I'd like to welcome Tim Carey. So Tim's a psychologist and a professor in um, mental health from the Northern Territory. Um, improving access to services is a key interest of yours and it's obviously really important in the Territory. And some of your, your research mentions things like patient-led scheduling and the close relationship between psychiatry and clinical psychology. So can you just, you know, in three words or less, tell us a little bit about how that works and the benefits in a rural and remote area? Yeah, sure Mary, it's great to be here. I run a, a psychology clinic within the public mental health service in, in Alice Springs, so I get referrals from case managers and, and psychiatrists and I, I operate a, a patient-led model of, of service delivery, so once they've been referred, the, the patients kind of um, book their own appointments rather than me scheduling them into appointments and, and I've found that um, doing things that way improves 
service capacity and and also access to services. There's a, there's a, a lot fewer missed appointments, um, so so that the clinics are fuller and and people can can get into to see me without long waiting times. Thank you. That, that's a, I mean it's such a simple idea, but it sometimes we get so stuck in the way that we do things. So mm -hmm. thanks for that. Um, and I would also very much like to welcome Professor Alan Rosen. Um, so Alan is a, a psychiatrist on our panel tonight and part of his work involves working in far west New South Wales and with remote communities. So could you tell us a little bit about your work in the remote communities and some of the challenges that, that you might have to face, Alan? Yeah, thanks Mary. <coughs> I, um, I've been um, 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 based in at Royal North Shore for 30 years, but for 35 years or so, I have now been working in um, far west New South Wales, based around Broken Hill and the um, small townships around most of them Aboriginal um, majority towns like Wilkenia. Um, <coughs> the um, um, the most perplexing thing that, that um, I still find there is the fragmentation of services um, in those towns. There's many services that come into those little towns, but um, the, uh, the coordination is limited and sometimes <clears throat> the funding is very limited. Um, the uh, Commonwealth um, has a habit of putting in uh, uh, projects into what they uh, consider to be um, complex or what they mean is difficult towns where they, they provide funding for you know an average of 18 months and um, uh, they change everything about and expect things to change uh, but then they don't follow up um, with, with any funding to make sure that things are sustained. So um, we're used to being um, um, cultural if not clinical band-aids out there and trying to pull things together um, and doing our best. Um, on, with visiting services to um, keep a continuous service going. Thanks very much, Alan. And I, I think this is a really experienced panel for this topic, so that's um, fantastic to have you all. Just a few ground rules. Um, m many of you have probably participated in these before. Um, you have a general chat box down on the left, um, and the orange technical help box is flashing a lot at the moment. Uh, participants, your audio will get better once we have fewer cameras on screen, so just hang in there. Um, please speak to each other in the chat box and often there's great conversations uh, going on there. I have received copies of the questions you submitted at registration. I won't get to address all of them but I will try to include as many themes as we can. Make sure that you um, post your comments and questions for the panellists in the gen general chat box and we do keep an eye on that and any technical problems in the technical chat box. Remember that other people can read your comments and so just behave as if it was a face-to-face -face activity. And if the chat is distracting to you, there's a small down arrow that you can click and then you don't have to watch it. At the end of the webinar, there's a um, feedback and exit survey and it's really helpful to MHPN for um, helping to determine what kinds of topics and, and technical things about the platform and so on to help us uh, continue to improve the webinar series. So we're going to speak about Jason, um, his situation you've already heard about. Um, he's a 42-year-old man who lives in a remote area of South Australia. Due to mounting debt, he's been unable to operate his farm and he's taken a job in the mine on a fly-in, fly-out basis to make ends meet. He's stressed by both his financial hardship and the forced separation from his family. Um, just um, quickly going back to the learning outcomes, the main thing about tonight is understanding the challenges which I'm sure everybody who's participating and on the panel already has a lot of ideas about that. Identifying the key principles of the featured disciplines approaches and um, exploring tips and strategies for how we can collaborate to assist people in rural and remote settings. Um, and I would now like to welcome, without further ado, Graham to um, respond to us um, as you would to Jason when he comes to see you in your local town as his GP. Thanks. Well, this, uh, I was doing this uh, 10, 15 years ago quite regularly, but not so much anymore. Uh, the first reaction is, how do I handle this in 15 to 20 minutes when I've got 30 to 40 patients to see? Uh, 
And the overlying thing that you've got to remember is I might have someone coming into um, the hospital with central chest pain, a six-year-old uh, uh, diabetic has collapsed. And what I have to do then is to actually stop what I'm doing and sort that out or I'm going to lose a patient. And this is no more or less serious. This guy may needs to be sorted out and he needs to be sorted out now because he may finish up dead in a very short period of time as well. The overriding thing that I see about this guy, he has no insight as to what's going on around him. And my first uh, and only priority is to gain rapport and to keep it. And the way I'd do that, in actual fact, is to take a quick history from him. I'd be asking him about non-threatening things like how was work at the mine, did he have friends at the mine, how were things going up there, how did he cope with being backwards and forwards, how was things going on at the farm, how did he cope with his relationship with his wife and his children, um, how did he think all that was going, um, and uh, he also had a friend that committed suicide. How did he feel about that? Did that have any effect on him? And basically just try and establish rapport and some sort of mutual understanding. The next thing I really want to do in very as quickly as I can, because I've got to really try and get rapport, but I'm, I'm, I'm time uh, limited. Uh, um, but really is important to get a handle on what's going on here. I ask him if he's aware of the stress and situation and, and, and how he feels he's coping. I want to know whether he's got friends uh, at the mine, whether he's still got friends in the town or whether friends in the town have dropped off. I'd like to know a little bit more about his alcohol ingestion and particularly any other social drugs he's having at home. He certainly won't be having them on the mine because he'll, he'll lose his job. Uh, and the thing that is overriding my sort of thought, thought is um, he probably has very little insight into uh, its, uh, the stresses he's under as the effect on his mental state. And one of the things that I've learned is that rural men have learned to be emotional philistines to survive the weather, the banks, the agencies, the governments and the sell their, their, their market. Uh, their, their crop or their, their output on, on, on the world market where there are ter terrible fluctuations. And these guys have to be able to, to suppress their emotions just to survive, to get by. So this is where we start. And one of the things that I've found very useful is to use a model that I developed about 35 years ago when I was living in an isolated mining town. And there was, certainly was no access to any other sort of mental health system at that time. And I actually learned this. Um, uh, 10 direct questions which belong to the, to the model and the important thing about these 10 questions is they tell you how well the guy is functioning, what's his functionality with life in general and I can slip these questions through quite quickly, how do you sleep, do you have trouble getting off to sleep, do you wake up in the middle of the night, does your mind go at 3,000 miles an hour, uh, you, what's your energy like, are you lethar lethargic? I don't ever ask about whether people are depressed because I very find people very rarely find people are depressed. I find them flat, irritable, frustrated, cranky, uh, cheesed off, lots of other things, but very rarely will they ever admit to depression. I ask about their motivation, whether it's difficult to, to get started, whether they've lost interest in things they like. I want to know about their concentration, whether they can read and watch TV or whether they're distracted all the time. I want to know about their memory. I want to know about their self-esteem, whether they feel good about themselves or they're self-denigrating, which is usually the way when someone is feeling down. And uh, I want to know what their socialisations with it was like, whether they were drawn, whether they still talk to their friends or do they want to not go out anymore. I want to know about with their appetite, whether they've become a picky eater and I want to know about their libido, whether it's diminishing. And those 10 questions I've learned over the last 35 years sum up how people are going. At the end of the day, when I finish treating these people, I want all those 10 questions to be answered the negative, but everything's going well and no side effects. That is the end point I'm after. I actually don't talk about depression, I talk about brain shutdown and if people have got access to, to, to the model in front of them, you'll see in the centre is a thing called the mood centre and I explain to people that in their brain they have a mood centre, it's probably it's perhaps not like that, but it's a good way to explain it, which normally controls those 10 things and also stabilises the autonomic or the automatic system. And when the mood centre shuts down, then they get all those symptoms of insomnia and tiredness and depression and, and uh, poor motivation distractible and then they get all those things that are answered in the negative 
and they get uh, psychosomatic symptoms such as headaches and palpitations, churned up stomach, uh, creepy crawly skin, tight in the chest. And these things will actually cr produce chronic stress. And I explain to patients that the chronic stress in itself is enough to shut the mood centre down. Now this guy, Jason, has got numerous stresses in his life which almost certainly would have shut his mood centre down, which would have produced the symptoms. And therefore we've got a cycle which he is actually depressing and going down. And so I explained to him that his brain shut down, that's why I can't sleep, while he's tired, while he's miserable, and that when he's drinking he actually feels a bit better, but in the long run he'll actually feel worse the next morning and it actually makes the whole situation worse. I mentioned quickly about the things that switches the mood centre on, but at this stage it's not something I would concentrate on too much. The, my initial management is still to maintain rapport and assess the risk and then consider what my options are. If the interview has gone very, very badly and he has become angry, remember he was already, already paranoid and he might think that I'm picking on him like everybody else has been and he just storms out of the system, then I think I've got an option to schedule him or detain him and for that I would actually uh, call the local policeman who probably in my area might be 150 kilometres away but would use him to actually uh, bring him in and detain him. But hopefully it hasn't got that bad because when I detain patients they do very badly. They go to Adelaide, they get shut up, uh, locked on a... On a uh, trolley in uh, accident emergency for three or four days. They come back uh, after being seen for 24 hours, very angry, don't want to see me under any circumstances. So for most reasons I would try and avoid scheduling them. The, the, if the, the, the uh, uh, situation's gone pretty well, I might try and persuade him to come into to hospital where I can say I can treat his stress, I can make him feel a lot better and uh, I can actually push some medication if I think that's where I want to go, I can push that quite quickly. Otherwise I might uh, negotiate to um, discuss it uh, with his wife and to be home and to, to, to take some medication there. Overall, uh, my, my most important thing is to provide hope and say we can fix the brain shutdown, we can fix his financial problems by talking to a counsellor or getting some solutions to him. And his problem is, look, is the missing machinery and the fencing material. So we, we promise to look into that and try and find a solution to that problem as well. Certainly I'll be making another appointment in a very short period of time, to, depending on the severity and what my risk assessment was. Be seeing him in 48 hours, 24 hours, maybe a week. Get some medic, uh, some uh, do a full medical, get some bloods for thyroid and... Uh, just some general screens and so basically uh, I would say we'd have some time off uh, uh, for a few days until we go to this all settle down, ask if we can bring in discussion with his wife because his wife is also a problem and so is his family, discuss with his wife some of the options and make sure everybody's on board moving in the same direction. So in five minutes that's perhaps how I'd go about solving this particular problem in my area. Graham, that was really helpful. There's so much feedback from the participants about that model and the 10 questions. So that's just fantastic. Um, on that note, everybody, you will be you will have access to the slides after the webinar is finished. So um, I think a lot of people will be using that, Graham. Thanks so much. Um, now I'd like to um, welcome the, our mental health nurse, David. So um, David, you might see Jason under under a slightly uh, different circumstance, and we'd be really um, interested to hear your thoughts about responding to Jason. Yeah, thanks, Mary. And um, certainly a different, um, a different circumstance, but very much uh, flowing on from um, where the, the the GP has assessed uh, uh, his, his status at the moment. Um, I really love the um, uh, the model. I really love the, uh, the, the the ten questions. The ten questions are pretty much fantastic. Excuse me, just for a sec. You, we can see yeah, your slides, yeah. David. So. Just, just, just a bit of um, um, interference there, um, and and certainly very much excluding the organic cause. And I know that uh, you know that, that we've spoken about that um, as a uh, um, as a baseline, but but certainly making sure that the general practice has excluded the organic cause, um, and uh, the, uh, the the mental health team, so mental health nurse within the mental health team, um, would look be looking at a, a biopsychosocial. 
assessment, finding out where, where, where he's up to uh, in his community, in his family, um, what might be uh, leading to um, these, uh, these odd experiences perhaps that he's having and, and, uh, and building on the rapport, very much relying upon the rapport from um, general medical practice. Um, you know, pretty much they've referred to us. We're now, um, we're now moving on from, uh, uh, from that initial referral. Uh, any, any number of um, specific assessment tools can be used, uh, modified Maudsley, uh, looking at the mental state examination and NeuroVeg. And I noticed that the, the, the 10 questions are, are a bit of a quick and dirty um, mental state examination and neurovegetative assessment. And they, and they are really, really very, very good. And I just have to keep endorsing them. His level of insight at the moment is very, Jason's level of insight at the moment is very, very limited and working out how we can plan care with him, we've managed to get him past the, um, the resistance for seeing a mental health worker uh, and being able to collaborate with him and with his family to work out you know, what's going to be useful for him, what's going to be useful for his, uh, for his family and trying to maintain that relationship. Um, the GPs uh, said that that relationship's good. Um, in, uh, in, in that assessment and uh, trying to build on the, 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 the usefulness of that relationship. It's also worth noting that um, the abilities of clinicians within a region uh, can be variable. Um, and we, we'll have uh, teams um, made up of five nurses. We may have teams made up of three social workers. Uh, we like to have a, 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 a multidisciplinary team, but we can't necessarily um, have uh, have um, all of those disciplines within one area, and uh, we'll often have new graduates because they're the they're, they're the people who we can attract uh, to country. Um, and being able to uh, to the teams to be able to support individual clinicians, um, providing those uh, that group of services. Uh, I notice my slides are moving on, so 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 should I. Um, uh, certainly, very important to to ask about suicide, even though he may not have mentioned about suicide. Really important to you know, put it on the table, showing the person that you really do care if they are thinking about suicide um, and, uh, and perhaps demonstrating to that person that you're the sort of person that, say, that you uh, would ask about suicide. Um, Jason works for a major uh, mining company and uh, so they will often have a work site health provider uh, and uh, I think it's reasonable for us to collaborate with them um, and getting whatever permissions we need to, maintaining the confidentiality for him and his, fa and his family. And a lot of people get really concerned about maintaining confidentiality in that uh, that means that families can't tell us stuff either. Whereas, uh, I think that's, that's something that we need to, uh, to, to break down and say that whereas we will need to maintain their family's confidentiality and that individual's confidentiality within a family, but the families can tell us whatever they think uh, we, uh, we need to know. And uh, similarly, the plan of care needs to be uh, to, to, to involve clinical choices, you know, what's going to be uh, useful for him over the long term. We very fortunately um, have access to telepsychiatry. We can get a psychiatrist's opinion um, if we think that that's going to be useful to, uh, to manage his care. Um, and uh, we can often get a psychiatrist's opinion within a few days um, through, uh, through our telepsychiatry process. It does need a local clinician um, at, the, uh, at the client end uh, and uh, having that local clinician um, can sometimes be a bit of a bit of a barrier, um, but that's that, you know, that's certainly necessary to support them uh, at the uh, at, at that end. And I know that we sort of touched slightly on it, and I also know that Alan's quite um, uh, has, has quite an opinion about involuntary treatment. Um, but I think that we should consider involuntary treatment you know, as uh, as we heard. If we if we need to invoke the Mental Health Act, well, we, we that's what we need to do, and um, it. It does very much need to be specific to his risk, and uh, um, and the, the 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 idea of making it as least restrictive and as as, as least um, confronting uh, as possible within whatever uh, our whatever our circumstances. And and people say, oh, you know, they don't want to be too restrictive, but often early involuntary treatment, if it's if if it is necessary, um, can be really very useful uh, in in. Uh, changing a person's life around and living with psychosis or dying by misadventure is certainly very, very restrictive. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, perhaps thinking about involuntary treatment. Um, and uh, uh, mental illness, particularly mental illness with country people, are, is quite episodic uh, and that perhaps 
um, we may be able to prevent involuntary treatment or prevent uh, the uh, the complexities uh, of uh, of the, uh, the the road um, down this man's mental illness if we can engage him in some some strategies about what does he want to happen next time, what does he want to happen uh, when he becomes uh, unwell uh, in the future. And uh, of course he is living in a rural property and he's living with children and I'm not suggesting that we need to take his children or his guns away but we do have to ask the question about you know, what are the risks, we have to ask questions of ourselves and perhaps of him, um, what are the risks regarding the children and what are the risks regarding uh, firearms. Um, and I know that that's not perhaps mandated in some states uh, and but it's certainly in South Australia we've had a medical practitioner um, prosecuted because he, he didn't follow up with the, uh, with the, with the, with the firearms issue. And, and indeed, in my, in my quick and dirty five minutes, that, that'll probably do it. Thanks, David. And when you come back to us, I'll just get you to move the um, mic a little closer to your mouth. It's just yes. it getting a bit quiet towards the end. Thank yes. you. Um, now I'd like to welcome Tim. Um, so I, I think that... Hi, Hi, it's pretty likely that Jason is going to get referred to a psychologist and we're really keen to hear from you about how you might respond to him. Thank you. Okay, thanks Mary. Um, I hope he does get referred. I really felt for him re um, reading the case study. So, so I'm assuming that, that he is the person referred to me as a psychologist and I, I, um, I just clarify that because it, it could actually be that Wendy, Wendy's the person who comes along. So, so I'm assuming from this that, that Jason somehow does come to see me as a psychologist. Um, so in the first session I'd want, to, I'd want to explain to him about the psychology service that I, that I offer, including the way that he can make appointments and, and things like the limits to confidentiality. I'd, I'd want him to have as much information as possible so he can be making an informed decision about the service or, or the treatment we're about to embark on together. Um, I also want to get some idea of, of his level of risk while we, were, while we were having the conversation. Most importantly, I'd be interested in hearing about the problem from his perspective and I'd be keen to find out how he thinks he could benefit from coming along to seeing me. Um, I'd also discuss with him including Wendy in the treatment but, but that wouldn't be a given um, and certainly wouldn't occur without his permission. Uh, in terms of the context, some of, some of the things that occurred to me as I was reading the case study, um, I'd be interested in knowing about any previous problems that, that Jason's had on the farm and how he solved them. I'd, I'd also um, be interested in, in hearing from him how he and Wendy came to be on the farm, how long they've been there, what they did before that, um, and so on. It would also be interesting for me to learn about the way in which the decision to take on the fly in, fly out work was made. Did, did Wendy and Jason make that jointly, or, or did it was it something that occurred to, to Jason? Did some friends of his tell him about it? Um, initially, it was going to be a temporary measure, but that seems to have changed. So, so how did it change, and and what what happened with that? My formulation of the problem would be informed by his, by Jason's views on what's happening. He appears, in, in my opinion, to be experiencing significant conflict between wanting to earn extra money on the one hand to support his family, but also having to abandon them in order to do that. He feels like an outsider at work, yet he doesn't socialise with his friends when he's back, and, and he can't play cricket in the team he used to play in because of the, the work that he's doing. He had a grand plan, but now he doesn't see an end in sight, and I'd be interested in exploring that. With him, he seems to have lost hope for the farm's future. What, what does he see in the future now? Um, does it bother him to have lost hope for the farm's future or, or does he have different priorities now? Um, the treatment I would provide would be to help Jason locate and resolve the main sources of his distress around those kinds of things that I've just talked about. An important focus may be his conflict about supporting and abandoning his family at the same time. It could also be useful to explore Jason's sense of powerlessness when he's away. Um, there, there were comments about Wendy having to get tradesmen that, that Jason thought he to do jobs that Jason thought he could have done, along with his feelings of being an outsider at work. How does he feel about that? Um, effective treatment for Jason would see him developing clear, unconflicted, and important goals about, for example, the sort of husband, father, and friend he'd like to be, as well as confidence strategies for how he might move in that in the direction that he'd like to head in. Um, treatment may also include Wendy, I, I mentioned that before, and, and it may be appropriate um, to, to look at a couple's perspective, um, or it might transpire that Wendy could benefit from ongoing psychological support as well. I mean, she, 
she's having to, to carry a lot of the load when Jason's away. Um, and treatment progress in the work that I do would be monitored using standardised questionnaires such as the, the depression, anxiety and stress scale and the outcome rating scale and session rating scale as well as keeping behavioural observations and notes of changes in reported attitudes and, and activity levels. That's, that's me. Thanks, Thank Mary. You, and I was just thinking about how your the outcomes that you're talking about would result in the 10 questions that Graham looked at also being resolved. And um, yep, definitely. he would, would be going back to his GP and if there's a mental health in that, in that practice, so those people would also be able to see the resolution of those things as a result of solving the, the problem. So thank yep. you very much, Kim. And um, last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite Alan to respond from the rural psychiatry perspective. And um, uh, are your, uh, your psychiatry delivery in Western New South Wales is face-to-face, uh, -face, I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with telepsychiatry as well. Yes. Thank you so much for your response. Okay, well maybe that's a good place to start because I think the issue for telepsychiatry is, um, and especially now that we have item numbers uh, for psychiatrists as well as other um, clinicians to be able to do telepsychiatry, um, the, sometimes I think we overbalance and only do telepsychiatry, uh, sometimes um, in association with a, a GP practice um, <clears throat> and sometimes um, um, more directly, but I think the problem is if you have a, uh, a nationwide telepsychiatry um, um, practice, that um, it, it would be uh, um, helpful if sometimes you can see that person in person. And I think that's um, with any telepsychiatry practice. And sometimes you can make arrangements so that you can, um, you, you may be having a a combination of a visiting practice and a telepsychiatry practice and I think um, that helps. The other thing that would help is to make sure that you do make contact and, and um, keep contact with the, the team or the people who live on the, on the ground um, in, that, in that township who could help you um, um, maintaining that practice. Now, I'll address the, the slides now, it's something we, I'm, I'm sure we could discuss further in terms of ground rules for telepsychiatry practice which I think is a really important component but I think we need to keep developing those ground rules. So <clears throat> just um, um, working with what has already been uh, said before, because I think we've got a, it, it's lovely to be working with such a dream team of people who are pulling together all those factors. And I won't go over them except to say the things that stood out for me um, with Jason's clinical issues was that he, he said he was um, stressed out, he's feeling depressed, um, the excessive uh, alcohol intake, um, that he had a mate who suicided recently, um, which obviously plays on his mind, um, although he won't talk about it, and there's a relationship strain, um, with, and it goes quiet if Wendy tries to discuss um, such things as his mate's suicide. Um, he has a mistrust of his neighbours, he's embattled, he has conspiracy theories encompassing the locals, including, uh, it seems, possibly the the, uh, the GP he's been he first uh, uh, Wendy first got him to see um, so uh, there is a question of a, a formal assessment for whether he is um, formally paranoid or whether the stress is just causing him to be embattled and uh, uh, this is an issue for assessment and also um, what everybody has said about the um, eliciting um, any suicidal ideas and then doing something practical uh, about allaying those. Can we have the next slide? Oh, I moved the next slide. I see. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> but behind the clinical issues, there are some um, very other important uh, things which uh, could be the risk or, or resilience factors. Um, and one is the uh, that's very worrying is the loss of his grand plan dream. I mean, I think everybody needs a dream um, to pursue that provides meaning and purpose in their life. Secondly, the issues of being lonely, separated and isolated, particularly when he's in his uh, FIFO phases. Thirdly, his sense of family abandonment. He feels that um, he's irrelevant to them, um, so in a sense they've abandoned him out of their day-to-day -day lives when he's away and he feels useless when he is, when he is there. 
Um, so in a sense, the abandonment goes both ways. Um, there's a loss of interest and enjoyment, which amounts to um, that um, technical term anhedonia. And um, he also has a sense of alienation. He's an outsider, um, in, um, the, particularly in the new culture, the FIFO culture, and um, that comes, comes back to Durkheim's concept of, of anime when you're um, feeling um, marginalised in some way um, from your community. It's, he has a loss of habitual role um, as a, com a competent farmer, a competent provider, a fixer of things, a competent husband, a father, and he has a sense of deep shame. Uh, that's worrying too. And he's got the mounting farm and household debt, and we know that there is a, a, a statistical association with household debt and, um, in this case, farm debt uh, and suicide. So we have to watch that as a... As a um, a worrying signal. And then there's the issue about drought, um, which is a, a slow burn disaster. It's not just a crisis in his life because a lot of people in his community are affected by it. When everybody's affected, then your resource people, um, your local resource people aren't as available to you. Um, uh, so this is something we need to watch, not just with him and the family, but the whole community. Wendy's concerns, um, she's trying to keep um, Jason engaged and involved in family life. She's worried that her husband is unhinged and may suicide. She tends to use terms like losing it and she's worried the GP will think that her husband is losing it and that brings some shame to her. So there is some issues of stigma for her. She's worried about the gossip network and sometimes in dying communities and in communities that are contracting, the gossip network seems to outlast the support network and it worries people. They want to try and um, keep um, their business um, uh, private in those circumstances rather than being able to draw on the communal resources. We'll come to that. And then there's the issue of who cares for the carer, especially in a small community. Who cares for Wendy if she's not prepared to talk about it outside the family? So we need to consider those as well. There is a, a, um, a concept um, around uh, in the literature called solastalgia um, uh, which means that um, it's the third point there, the distress of loss of solace caused by the degradation of the environment, the home and the sense of belonging. It sounds like your, your life and the environment are turning to sand. Um, in, if you translate that into uh, indigenous terms, we haven't talked about um, the possibility that he may have indigenous heritage as well. So we haven't. We see, we need to ask about that. Um, but um, in terms of times of drought, um, we find um, Indigenous uh, Aboriginal communities talking about we belong to the land. And if the land is sick, so are we. We feel sick as a community and sick, sick as individuals. And if the river dries up, where will we meet? Um, uh, if the river dries up, so will we. So you hear um, terms like that used. So that. There's a personification of what's happening to the environment. Then there's this issue um, about dealing with complexity. And it's what I call a quintuple whammy. Um, and I know what a quintuple whammy is. You've probably heard the term double whammy from Little Abner, the, the uh, um, comic strip. Uh, I know what a quintuple whammy is because I've had a quintuple bypass, so I can count to five. And um, quintuple um, whammy in includes being indigenous or marginal in some sense. So in a sense, he's feeling marginal, even if he hasn't got indigenous heritage, he's feeling marginalized in his life and in terms of the loss of role. Um, secondly, um, living in remote circumstances where even lack of transport can be a, um, a form of disability. Um, and um, sometimes people can't afford the petrol when they're living in drought conditions and just trying to hang on. Um, so that becomes a form of disability. Living with multiple deprivation, like homelessness or poverty, and this family certainly in poverty, having a mental illness, and then also having a comorbid drug and alcohol or physical disorder. Now, that's, um, I think that adds up to um, working with complexity and the way to work with all those factors. Some of them are clinical and some of them are functional and some of them are cultural. So we need to take a holistic approach. And I think everybody before me has taken this wider um, approach, and I think it's my role as a psychiatrist in this situation to endorse this 
wider biopsychosocial, cultural, um, environmental, the world, the universe, and everything type approach to it, taking a holistic role. So that brings us to the final um, approach, which is the communal adaptation set strategies. Rather than just looking at what we can do clinically and individually and with this couple or this family, we need to recognize the whole community that he comes from, this little community may be um, un undergoing communal hardship. We need to look at communal awareness raising, um, farm gate meetings, mental health education. We need to r remind ourselves on, of and call on communal strengths and resilience because these, these um, communities have been through this before and even though they're going through hardship, they can draw on strengths and they, if they're reminded of what they did last time and what they could do, uh, and if their ideas are invoked um, and honoured. We need to help them instill hope and optimism, mobilise their extended kinship networks. These are traditional healing factors that we sometimes lose, but um, these little communities have often had in spades but have not, um, are not invoking now because they think their, their community is disappearing like those, those shifting sands. Um, and we need to draw on holistic solutions, including those spirit, spiritual dimensions um, of the biopsychosociocultural approach. And we need to ensure that um, um, Jason and others in that community have meaningful work and communal roles so they feel that they are included in their community and they do mean something not only to their families but their communities. They need a reminding of that. So there are clinical factors and I think there are, there are wider factors in the community. Thanks so much, Alan. So I think that um, what I'd really like to do now is to invite Graham back in. Um, so Graham, you've referred um, Jason if, if there is a clinician for him to see in your community or perhaps via telepsychiatry. And um, he's, he's come back to you. There's been a lot of questions from the, um, the participants around the kind of complications of, of you know, boundaries and role conflicts in communities. So there's a fair chance that the, you know, your children might go to the same school or you, you, your partners are in the same social organisation. So I wonder if you've got any reflections from your years of experience about how you handle those kind of situations. So if you had someone as, as concerning as Jason and you also had some other relationships with him and his family, how do you care for him and yourself in that situation? Um, Graham, I think you might still have your phone on mute. Sorry, say again? I think you were still muted. So if you don't mind starting that sentence again. Are we back on now? Yeah, it's great. Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, it may be, uh, the community's probably already got opinions about this guy. He's probably said some things. People have noticed he's withdrawn, noticed he's, he's different. Um, I, I think... Uh, Small communities, people notice what's going on around them, and one of the, that's one of the the disadvantages, but one of the assets. Because what we do is train the community to recognise people and send them in to get some help. But the, at the end of the day, what we need to do is to take all those labels off them and make them normal members of the community. If we do that, we actually succeed quite well. So I don't think we need to worry too much about privacy. We're all used to living in the same fishbowl. It's only people that move in from, from outside that have some trouble adjusting. So we're used to living in the same fishbowl and uh, we need to learn to be supportive as a community and actual fact get rid of all those labels and whatever else by making people well again and functional again. And that's the whole point about the 10 questions is matter of getting people back to normal function and uh, enjoying life again. And Graham, I know while I've got you, I know that you also had a question for Alan around, was a really practical question around ketamine. So do you, do you want to address that to Alan and we'll bring Alan back in? Alan, there's been some uh, work about ketamine being very good for reducing um, depression very quickly in, in some people. And the other question I would have about transferring um, detained people to Adelaide, which I've got to do by air, which is always a risk and danger, and, and, and the safety using ketamine rather than sedating people out of their brain with all the other sedatives we use. Yeah, I, I have some reservations that come out of the literature about ketamine too, about uh, some dissociative states 
that have been written up. And I think until that's clarified, I would uh, reserve my judgment on ketamine. Um, uh, and people get uh, quite disturbed um, and fearful of those dissociative states if, if they occur. Although they don't, they occur in a minority, but it's still a worry. Um, so I would think um, um, we we need to find out a bit more about those um, those possible um, uh, adverse effects. Thanks, Sam. Thank Thanks both very much for that. Now, um, Graham, I I wonder also if you've had much experience with your your patients of using um, the e services, whether that's um, counselling via the internet or phone or seeing a psychiatrist and just any thoughts about that? The psychiatrists are really hard to come by. There's one visits uh, the whole area which is probably 20, 30,000 people every month so it's hard to get them in um, and if there is uh, sometimes you can get them in. Um, basically what I can't provide, uh, we don't provide. The problem with telehealth is often there's a word sync although that's getting better um, but if they need follow-up, often you don't get the same psychiatrist again. Um, so I must say I've got to a stage where I try to manage most of the stuff myself. If they are privately insured, it's still um, for the patients $300, $600 to get to Adelaide to see a private person. Um, it's very minimally refunded, so it's great expense. Uh, access to psychologists and uh, psychiatrists is very difficult. We can use mental health plans, but again, it's probably a three-month wait to get into a psychologist. And then there's um, probably monthly meetings uh, with a psychologist. It's all uh, just very, very difficult. What I do do uh, for some of the people who are computer literate is I use um, some of the, the websites to do some uh, of the uh, CBT work that I don't have time to do. Um, so I use uh, places like Mood Gym or uh, the Black Dog has uh, another uh, CBT stuff. And I tend to just use in my normal, normal consultation some activity scheduling or some uh, motivational interviewing wherever I see that appropriate. So I tend to just move things as I see fit. And, and Graeme, if there, is, if there is someone who is somehow accessing a psychologist or working with a mental health nurse, there's been a lot of comments about tonight's panel being a dream team. So I'm going to ask David and Tim next as well, but just with you, what, what are some tips that you'd have on collaborating with a GP if you are a mental health nurse or a psychologist? What do you find helpful as a GP? Um, well, I think we're just, just some open communication. Um, normally, uh, I have trouble getting access to a mental health nurse um, and uh, but once uh, once that does happen, we need to be on the same page and working in the same direction. So we need to have the same sort of uh, ideals and where we, we, we're heading to and what each other's doing. So I think that's just important as working as a team. Thank you very much. And, and Tim, I might go to you next. What are some of your sort of thoughts around collaboration? So if um, Jason was actually seeing a mental health nurse in the general practice and seeing you as well, um, what kind of things have been have worked for you and your clients in the past about communication collaboration? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, I, I've been really lucky, I think, in, in the places I've worked in. I, I worked in rural Scotland for five years and actually worked in GP practices. So um, collaborated very closely with GPs there. Um, would type notes into the patient's file that the GP could read the next time they saw the patient. Um, in the, the job that I'm in now, um, I'm in the public mental health service where I collaborate very closely with the psychiatrists and mental health nurses who refer people to me. Um, and I have to say, as a psychologist, I, I feel really lucky um, working like that. Um, David mentioned uh, excluding things like organic causes before. I can I can just assume all of that's already been done because the, um, the people who come to see me have already um, often been to their GP and certainly been to to their psychiatrist or, or mental health nurse before I get to see them. Um, so having me being able to focus on, on the psychological aspects of, of their recovery um, means that the psychiatrist and, and case managers can focus on, on the other aspects that are important as well. Thanks, Tim. And David, I wonder if you had any comments about how, how you work um, collaboratively over distance with looking after someone like Jason? Yeah, I, I, working collaboratively with both the community psychologists 
the uh, generic social workers and the GPs, I think it's best to get them to owe you one. Um, have, a, have a collaborative relationship in which you have supported them at a tough, at a tough time um, when they've needed a bit of uh, you know, clinical input or uh, urgent intervention that you, know, you, you stepped outside your role a bit. And, and, and in that manner, that you can then sometimes get them uh, to step outside their, you know, step outside whichever silo they uh, they, they happen to be in. Um, getting access to generic support, I think, is really, really important, really useful. Um, being able to um, know where to find the NGO that's going to fit in with your client now because you've uh, you've developed that relationship in the past. And I know that Graham um, referred to um, a, a time when the uh, the program comes and then it goes away. You know it, it, that, that it's no longer available, uh, and and some, that's something that I might refer to as, as NGO fatigue, non-government organisation fatigue, where um, clinical providers in an area who uh, are accustomed to having uh, organisations that are funded come in, do a great program, and then disappear. And it happens so often that you then don't end up not engaging with the next program because you, you know you think, oh, they're just going to last for so long. So, so being aware that that can become really fatiguing, really becoming aware that you, know, you, you, you pick the fruit when it's ripe, um, that you, you, you use those supports um, uh, when, when you can. Um, and if I can just go back uh, a bit to uh, the comments about ketamine, um, rural people are very uh, wary of ketamine. They've often known about ketamine in veterinary, uh, for its veterinary use, so that they'll, they'll often see it as uh, a drug that's been used on animals. Um, and, uh, and whereas I, I certainly know that a, uh, a combative unwell person in an aircraft um, is, is not a good thing, um, uh, telling someone that, uh, that, that you're giving them um, a, a drug that they recognise as something that, that's been given to their animals is you know, just one more layer of uh, one, one more layer of concern uh, for them at the time. That's a really interesting perspective, David. And I, I know that sometimes at the other end. Um, the sedations that are used and, and things to transport people safely can then have a really big impact on what's possible at the other end in terms of assessment and how long it takes before you can actually assess someone. So that's really interesting stuff. And I wondered on a practical question, how do you find out who's on the ground in the community? Like if you're not in that community and you're looking after someone, you know, who you visit once every couple of weeks or you speak over Skype or the phone, do you, do you, what kind of local resources can tell you which NGOs are there and who's good at the moment, practically? Yeah, the health, the health mafia um, knows these things. Um, the, the, the local community health service will have a visiting service, will have a, uh, will have a, a physical presence. Um, and uh, you know, certainly I know that there are a couple of towns where uh, there are hospitals but no community mental health services or no, no community services and certainly having a relationship with the, um, uh, with the key players within that hospital or within that, medic, that local medical service. You know, that's, 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 the, that's the key, is knowing the local people. Um, and, uh, and, and I often do that by providing um, uh, mental health specific education to the practice nurses or to the, to the general nurses, to the allied health staff within, uh, within that area. And by, by, by offering that, that bit of community education to those individual clinicians, They'll often then speak about their their their, um, uh, their own circumstances and their own clients, and that will often lead me to you know, who who are the providers in that area, who are the useful people to know, who uh, you know who who are the community champions. And so I think that that brings us back to what to what Alan was saying about one of the the sort of technical well strategic things about telepsychiatry would be to sometimes actually be seeing people in person as well and I'm sure one of the things about that is actually getting to know the local players on the ground and Alan I wondered if you'd like to come back in and just give any further comments about some practical things about providing tele services because there's been a lot of questions from registration and uh, from the participants just around the practicalities of providing like e-mental health care of various different sorts. Yep. Um, I'm, am I still off air? Says I'm still off here. You're you're on. We can hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we need to develop standards. I know in my own profession, um, the the, um, the the College of Psychiatrists um, 
the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists do have a position paper which is fairly detailed on uh, telepsychiatry um, which uh, they really conceive of uh, something around a, an item number um, and I'm aware that, that that item number can be used like anywhere in the nation um, but um, and you get paid for the item number but the problem is you like in uh, city fee-for-service practices you don't get paid for liaising you don't get paid for liaising with the the, um, um, the people who work on the ground with the GP unless you're doing um, a, a care plan and and uh, that, that doesn't amount to regular liaising um, and um, you don't get paid for liaising with the family and um, sometimes the, you're particularly in a very remote lo locations you have the family is the are uh, the major supports, and they need to be in the loop in a res respectful way and with the permission of the person who's there, where um, who's there with the, with the disorder, if, if possible. So I think it's really important that we actually find ways of uh, of doing it res respectfully, and also, where possible, it's not it's not always possible, um, having some time where you can. Um, uh, review that person in the town. It might only be every few months or every three months or something that you come into town, but at least to see the people you still have, you're still supporting or still seeing clinically, um, if it's possible. Otherwise, it's very important to develop a relationship with the GP who's managing them um, or the mental health team. And it comes back to how you find out that resource. And the, and the local health districts should be able to tell you who's working um, on the ground, all the agencies that are working in their in their patch. Part of the problem, though, is some uh, NGOs are federally funded and are not tied to uh, to providing um, uh, support services around catchments, more around um, postal um, codes or or some some other uh, uh, concept which doesn't align with the LHD um, uh, the LHD funding, which means. One of the problems we haven't we haven't got to anywhere in Australia is planning together whether we're FIFA service, NGO, or public services. How we create a plan for a locality or for a catchment, and how we then work together to that plan. And I think it's possible that we just don't seem to have got around to doing it. And I know that some of the mental health commissions are getting interested in doing that, um, and I hope that that comes about. Thanks very much, Alan. And I think you raise a really interesting point there about how how you include the, the family when they might be the primary support in a very remote place um, if you're providing teleservices. And um, so I wanted to bring Tim back in just to talk about some of the ways that um, that you might go about including Jason's family in this, but also the question of what 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 to do when you know Wendy might actually be his main support, but perhaps due to his paranoia or perhaps for other reasons that we don't know about, he actually says he doesn't want you to talk to Wendy. So I suppose there's two questions. One is about ways of going about including the family, but then what do you do if the person says no? Yeah, thanks Mary. I, I think it's a really um, important issue and, and one I had first-hand experience with um, a couple of years ago. I was seeing a, a chap for um, some chronic depression. He told me that he didn't want his partner involved in the, the treatment. Um, he, was, he worked full time, he was, he was quite functional in all, in all sorts of ways. He, he was also linked in the psychiatry and so on. His wife um, ended up making a, a complaint about some of the, the things that we were doing that she wasn't happy with. I contacted my professional indemnity insurers and, and they were very clear that um, the, the solicitor I spoke to said that it's a, and he was from Adelaide, he said it's a finable offence in South Australia to talk to anyone else about a patient's treatment without that patient's explicit permission and consent. So, so that was a real wake-up call um, for me and, and very good to, to find out about. Um, if I, I, On the other hand, I, I have, I'm seeing a couple at the moment, but I'm seeing, and I see both of them and I see them separately, but I'm seeing them for, for separate issues. Um, it's, it's one of the challenges of working in, in rural and remote practice where the um, access to, to clinicians is limited. I also saw a woman uh, about 18 months ago who was going through a marital preparation. Her husband wanted to come and see me as well 
because um, he, he didn't have much money and couldn't access private practice psychologists. But in that instance, I didn't end up seeing him because I thought, because of the context of the marital difficulties that were going on, I didn't think I could legitimately see both of them at the same time and keep those those therapies separate, if, if you like. And they, and they weren't, they didn't want couples therapy, they both wanted individual therapy um, for for the, the issues they were both going through. So I'm not sure that I've got an easy answer, unfortunately. It, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. I have to say it's one of the issues I really love about rural and remote practice, having to grapple with the kind of ethical and professional dilemmas. Um, I feel like I'm just hedging my bets now, but um, but it is it is a really difficult issue. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Uh, just your thoughts are really helpful. Cause I'm sure you know we don't come up with the answers in these webinars. We you know share ideas. I think that's what collaboration is, and it yeah, just made me think about um, <laughs> debriefing and supervision. And I wondered, um, David, if you had any thoughts about you know when you are dealing with these complexities where you might have to see people with lots of crossover with you and your family and with each other in the community. How do you look after yourself and how do you keep making the best ethical decisions when things are complex and not simple? And clinical supervision in the aisle at the IGA. Yep, I've been there. Um, <laughs> I, I noticed there was a couple of, uh, of, of um, comments about uh, telepsychology rather than telepsychiatry. And, um, and just use this opportunity to, um, uh, to say that the uh, Flinders Uni has a telepsychology program which links into one of the rural towns um, in South Australia. A bit of a pilot program and a bit of a way that they provide supervision for their students um, uh, by having them engage in a therapeutic relationship with a, um, with, with a couple of clients. Uh, over a period, so you get to see the same psychologist uh, uh, on a few occasions uh, or for for their term, um, whilst they are also being supervised by a, uh, a practicing psychologist. So, uh, you know, teleclinical psychology is happening. It is a it is a pilot. You know, it's not something that um, is is generally available, but certainly it's something to be celebrated. Um, I provide clinical supervision, and I receive super clinical supervision by tele uh, by telehealth through telehealth. Um, and certainly, I, I uh, will have to agree very, very strong, strongly with uh, Alan. You have to meet the person in person. You have to meet the people in person um, on a few occasions a year. Uh, uh, providing that support and receiving that support only by a digital telehealth network, um, I, I think it, we, it wouldn't work. You need to be able to breathe the same air uh, for, for at least some part of that uh, some part of that time. Um, yeah, so, so having that, that, that having that strong external um, uh, clinical support by a person who's in a similar position but you know, physically dislocated, that, that, that's really that's very good. And Graham, I wanted to go back to you. Um, I guess particularly with your your um, work in the the area of suicide prevention, um, how do you? Again, I suppose it's a similar kind of question, but sometimes these are really um, very difficult situations, and as you pointed out, Jason's just as, as much of risk, at risk of dying as some of the people collapsing in your emergency department, and you have to prioritise that. But how do you, as a GP, you know, hold yourself together? Um, I've not done very well in that department, and I should be just ashamed of myself. But the way I've done it is just to work harder, and as long as I keep work, working harder. I find uh, I can just put it in the back of my brain, but I can't now watch anything on television where anxiety or stress builds up. I just have to get up and walk away. The treatment for that is uh, to expose your therapy, and that scares the daylights out of me, so I'll just keep getting up and walking around, but I can do without movies and that sort of stuff. While I've got you there, just a couple of interesting things. Uh, one of the, the, the tricks I used was to turn my wife from a teacher into a mental health counsellor. When she became a mental health counsellor, I said, oh, well, you can't work in my area because that's going to be a conflict for us. But um, it's just, it was just an interesting sideline. My wife is now a, a mental health counsellor, but I've made her work in another area because of the conflict involved. There's just one other final thing I really want to say that I think is, is really important about suicide prevention. Most of our people 
well, nearly all of them get well again, but the risk for their suicide actually increases as they're getting better, particularly for the first two or three weeks. And it doesn't matter what modality you're using, whether you're using some psychotherapy or CBT or uh, medication, as they, they get better, then uh, often they'll be motivated to uh, go and, 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 and suicide uh, because the, the depression doesn't um, improve as rapidly as their motivation does. And, and if people tend to be a little bit reactive and work on the, spirit, on the spur of the moment, these people need to be watched. So if someone's getting better from, from something like this, and particularly Jason would be a big worry, as he was getting better, I'd be watching him very closely for three to four weeks until those suicidal thoughts had evaporated altogether. And Graeme, what, what do you mean by closely? How many times a week might you see him? Well, it depends if they've got strong suicidal thoughts. You know, there's a sort of... I, I never ask people if they're suicidal um, because they always say no. I say, have you got the stage where life's worth li uh, not worth living? And they say, oh, yes, yes, no. What have you thought about doing? I haven't thought about doing anything. But people in this situation do. Oh, well, I thought I might drive my car into a tree uh, or I, 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 might, uh, I might gas myself. And I said, well, have you done anything about it? Well, yes, there's a rope in the back of the car. That to me means automatic admission or detention. You know, you just got to work out how how strong those suicidal thoughts and how how, how far they progress down the track. And once you work that out, then you can work out what you have to do. Thanks very much. And Graham, we're just approaching the end of the evening, so I, I you've just been so. Um, I really appreciate your honesty, and I think that's one of the things that's lovely about these webinars. Is people are really real people who are trying to do real work and that's, I know the uh, participants appreciate it too and I wondered if you had any just final um, things, you messages you'd like to get across as you can. Well, the, the message, uh, most mental illness if we can get it early can be reversed and people can be put back to normal and I can't emphasise the importance of early intervention of starting to screen people even your surgery it's very easy to ask those three questions you've got a sore throat have you, uh, are you, does it keep you awake at night? Yes, it does. How long have you been sleeping? Oh, about three or four months. All of a sudden, you've got a trigger that maybe there's something else going on back there. So you've got to keep looking at your community. You've got to train your community to recognise the warning symptoms in themselves and other people and tell them and make sure that where they go, uh, they are going to get the right support. For example, I wrote out a, a list of questions my nurses ask when they come into accident emergencies. So when someone comes with emotional problems or whatever, instead of saying the doctor's too busy or popping them off, something's done. So I, I think if we can get community ownership and community-driven uh, responses, it doesn't take money. It takes someone that cares and has got the motivation to do it. Thanks. That's a great um, note to to finish on from you with your years of really practical on the ground experience. Now I'd like to invite David if you'd um, have a few final comments for a couple of minutes. Thanks Mary. Um, I, we, we're discussing a, a, a man in a rural um, in a rural town and his wife and, and their circumstances and in, in many respects he's an amalgam of uh, of many of my own clients um, and I'm sure uh, of the other panel members. I think it's interesting that we we tend to think about men's mental health um, in terms of seeking seeking. <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've said that um, you know, um, men are emotional philistines. And, sorry, rural men have had to be emotional philistines in order to, to uh, weather their way through the bluster of, of rural life. And, um, and, and certainly from a defence perspective, you know, um, very, very, very strong, brave men um, are, are completely um, paralysed by fear when they start talking about their own emotions. Uh, and, and so, it, I, I, I can't put that into a different context. I try and put that uh, instead of take it away from the help-seeking context because you know that's um, that's. The, that's the language we tend to use. Is you know pe people need to seek help, and I try and put it into the take action context. Is that this is about them taking action in order to prove, improve um, their lives, their families' lives, their their their, their, their lives and their livelihood within the community. It's really practical. I'll use it tomorrow. 
Thanks very much, David. Uh, Tim, would you like to offer a couple of final comments? Um, not really, Matt. I, I think we've kind of covered um, just about everything that I can think of. And I, and I must say that um, the participants are, are covering lots more. I'm having a hard time keeping up with all of their all of their comments. There's some great discussion going on. I think for me, um, meeting Jason where he's at, giving him, as, as Graham mentioned, giving him some hope that as dreadful as it seems now, it, it will get better. We, we will be able to figure this out. Um, keeping, uh, keeping in mind that the context that the Jason has, um, he's, he's a, a farmer and all that, that that means about his connections to the land. He's now dislocated from the land in a, for, for three weeks at a time in a, in a community where he, where he feels like an outsider. And also the impact on Wendy that, that she's kind of carrying the can and, and looking after the kids and, and the farm and, and keeping things together while he's away. So, so they're, they're really doing it tough at the moment. And, and it is something that I think that they'll, they'll need a lot of support with, but it's also something that I think they'll be able to, to get through. Rural and remote people are, are amazingly resilient and creative and, and I've, I've no doubt that they'll be able to, to figure out a, a really satisfying solution to this. And so I'd, in the early sessions, I'd, I'd be wanting to convey that kind of hope and optimism to, to them. Thanks so much, Tim. And Alan? A few things backed up here. Um, I, I um, first of all think the issue, the issue of stoicism is really important, and it's not just an issue of, of, of rural men, although obviously it becomes um, uh, fairly um, marked um, in those circumstances that have been described. But um, the problem about men's mental health in general is is something, and the the way that they um, are prepared to talk about physical health, but not about mental health. Um, and uh, we need to address that. And there is, um, uh, in next February, there's the themes, Mental Health Service Conference of Australia, mental, um, a summer forum on that issue, on men's mental health, with Max Birchwood um, coming from England, um, amongst others. Um, and the issue there is that it, it happens in every age group. Um, we've studied it in older, older farmers, um, in drought conditions, that happens in younger farmers as well, and this is a young young dad in some ways, or he's still of um, early middle age. It also happens in young disaffected men, um, and uh, we also need to think about um, how their women folk um, deal with this and adapt to this, and, and and how they can help them most. So men's mental health isn't just about men; it's about their women folk and their families as well. I think the issue of stoicism and how to how to get past it is very, fairly similar to the issue of how to address suicide. We've heard the opinion that we shouldn't talk about um, suicide directly because men don't want to talk about it. That's true. On the other hand, um, we've also heard about you should ask about suicide at some stage. Well, I think there are, there are ways to get there um, bit by bit. You start asking about um, um, whether people have felt out of sorts in some way, whether they felt they can't go on. Um, get to asking about whether you think you might do anything to harm yourself. You go, you know, it's, it's a continuum, and I think you can get into a conversation. As far as stoicism, you can join that conversation either individually, or that's where men's groups do come in, because then men can start talking about emotions gradually. Um, and I think it's a matter of, of making sure you persist until you actually start dealing with some of those crises when people feel really comfortable with each other. And I think the same thing goes with engagement with clinicians. We think we just engage at the beginning, but in fact, and it's been talked about earlier today, tonight, that we need to talk about sustaining that engagement. Engagement occurs at every stage, and as you get more and more comfortable with people, you can talk about deeper things. So I think we really ought to get uh, be uh, involved with that. The last thing was involuntary treatment, and people asked me to address, uh, to address that um, a, a little, and I think while I think that we, there are some times when you have to do involuntary treatment, I don't think we do enough either urban or rural to, to make sure that we make the conditions appropriate for, and congenial for doing voluntary care. We, we, we know that we have a repertoire of evidence-based ways of, of producing a, a therapeutic alliance and of finding ways where people can keep their agency and keep their decision-making powers 
like living wills, um, like shared decision making, and there's technology that has helped that along. And we need to use that repertoire systematically so that we maximise the amount of, of involuntary care, because I think we overuse involuntary care in English-speaking countries, not just Australia, um, both in the community and in hospital. And there are better ways of engaging people, as um, uh, Graham says too, is, in, in a way that they'll come back to you the next time when they, when they need help. They won't shy away from it because they're, you're going to remove their, their agency. Thanks so much, Alan, and I'm sure that's actually probably a, a topic we should consider for another webinar because I think it's a really um, com complex topic with lots of different ideas and that, that's actually a really good idea. So thank you so much for everybody's contribution tonight, um, particularly your humanity and the practical um, tips that everybody has provided and I know the uh, participants have appreciated that. There's been hundred, about 260 people online tonight and I know lots of people download these later. The podcasts are available in a few days' time. Um, the next webinar will be working together to support the mental health of injured workers, which is a really interesting topic. On the 19th of August, you can register through the MHPN website. Please make sure that you complete the exit survey before you log out. And uh, you will be sent a, li a link to the resources associated with the webinar within uh, two or three business days. And um, thank you all again, and we look forward to seeing you at another MHPN webinar. Thank you and good night.